afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. Uh, this is a continuation of Eastman's um, online technical training. Um, today, we're going to be talking about troubleshooting the S154. Um, it's not really a fault, but notification on the v new Vita Dense 200 and 100E series boilers. And uh, right now, I'm going to introduce you to Scott Boutlier. He's the um, uh, Academy instructor on our west coast of Canada. Uh, this is all a Canadian team today, even though this is a North American project. This is a Canadian team today. So uh, Waterloo for me and Langley for Scott. Go ahead, Scott. All right. Well, thanks very much. Just been uh, before we started this, just kind of mentioning to Mark, it's been a while since I've uh, put on a, a little online training here. So if I stumble around a bit, please excuse me. But uh, hopefully we'll have about uh, I just time this. It's probably around maybe 40 minutes, 45 minutes of, of time. All right, so I'm, I'm in the mode here right now. You can all see my screen. Uh, I, uh, I'll get started here. As Mark said, it's the S154 status message. And uh, with the new boilers, and these are the ones that you can see the S.154 status will uh, possibly show up on. On the left-hand side, you've got your 100 boilers. There's six different models and makes of the uh, Beetledens 100 B1 HE or B1KE. And there's this kind of the screen on the left-hand side here that you kind of stand in front of the interface. And on the right-hand side are the Vitodens 200 boilers. There's a lot of similarities between these boilers, and this message happens to be one of those things that's very similar uh, between the, uh, the the boilers themselves. But you'll see the screen is a little bit different on the four uh, 200s versus the six uh, 100 boilers. And the 200s could be cascaded, so you might see a different screen uh, depending on what you're what you're standing in front of. So just kind of toggling back and forth there, the type of screen you might see in front of the 200s. Uh, so the 154 message, the boiler is trying to communicate something to you, and that's kind of our, our, our goal today is to kind of uh, give you that information so that you'll know where to find these messages. So it's a 154. There's a multitude of messages that you might see, fault messages, warnings, information messages. We'll kind of scroll through a little bit of that stuff as we move through. Uh, and you'll know where to find those messages confidently after uh, this presentation. Uh, what are involved in the S154? So when we have a this uh, status message showing up, uh, there are a couple of components that are involved in the 154 uh, internal to the boiler. There's also external influences, obviously, with uh, with many things that are involved with uh, appliances, external influences. But we'll look at the main components inside of the boiler that uh, that would be involved in possibly troubleshooting or identifying uh, when we're rolling through the S154. Uh, how the fill, e filling and purging functions work. Uh, when you commission these boilers, you go through either using the HMI, which you see here, the, the interface you see here, or you could use your, uh, your electronic device and you can use the V-Guide app and go through uh, your commissioning and these filling and purging functions would be part of either one of those you choose. It's part of the whole process. Uh, I want to explain how those two functions actually work when you're when you're performing them in commissioning and why they will help you be successful uh, in your commissioning that you come out of commissioning and the boiler isn't in the S154 mode. It's going to be firing and operating as you expect it to be. So we'll kind of roll through that and scenarios that you might see the S154. Uh, I'm involved, uh, as a lot of the academy instructors are, uh, when we're not doing training, we, we kind of look at, uh, you know, assisting sometimes the, the tech group uh, across the North America here. So the guys in the U.S. might uh, help out the guys in the, down in the U.S. and us Canadian uh, instructors might be involved with the, the, the tech group up here in the north. Um, and a lot of what this information is, is uh, information gathered when I've been, you know, talking to somebody on the other end of a line that has the S154 and the different scenarios that I've come across here. So not every single, uh, you know, S154 uh, issue will be, you know, part of this 40 minute presentation, but I'm just trying to give you the, the, the things that, that we've come across here on a fairly regular basis and try to communicate that to you. So if you do happen to be in front of a boy with S154, we're gonna give you some tips there on how to, how to navigate through that and be successful in getting that boiler up and running. So that's the, the kind of the goal here today. Uh, so first thing is to find out where, where these faults and messages are actually being stored in the boiler as information. Uh, you have a couple of different 
uh, types of faults here. There's five kind of in particular you can look at. Each different message would have a, a different letter in front of it. That's kind of how you identify whether it's a, a fault or a, or a service or status message here. And uh, the one area in the boiler, whether it's a 100 or a 200, will locate all of these uh, messages for you. So they're all in kind of one particular area as we, we go through here. But these are just a sample of the different types of messages you might see in the various forums that they're kind of provided uh, by the boiler. So the boiler is going to provide a lot more information and communication with these new ones than just a fault that's caused the boiler not to operate. So we've got five different types of forms of messages. And if I'm standing in front of a 100 boiler, uh, whether it's a HE or a KE, uh, you'll have the screen in front of you like we have here and how I find these messages. Uh, couple ways on the, on the one note. I'll go through both scenarios for you here. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, using the menu key on the left-hand side of the boiler. The little red uh, with yellow outlined hand there is, uh, is pushing on that uh, menu key. And then that's going to take us into the main menu. You're going to scroll with the down arrow key to see information highlighted. And from there, you can push the OK button. And from the OK button, uh, you're going to have an information. There's a, a different uh, kind of snippets of information. We're going to go to system information, highlight it, and then push the OK button. And then from here, you have active messages. So if there is something caused in that boiler, that you know the reason why you're there as a technician, that boiler is not working or functioning as you anticipate it to be, you'll see an active message there. And you'll see it with a little bracket. Maybe it's one message or a multitude of messages. Uh, and you can uh, highlight that active message, push the OK button, and you would see what that message is. Or you could scroll down to message history, and if there's been past uh, messages, they'll always be archived uh, up to the latest 10 messages, and then they start to uh, kick out the oldest message and, and with, with new message uh, um, occurring in the system here. So it's a kind of an ongoing kind of storing of, of messages as we move through so there's active and then there's archive messages that we're looking for here so stored and current messages and you just push the ok button there to enter any one of those areas the second way to kind of navigate through the uh the 100 boilers to look at where messages are stored uh is if you uh take your fingers and make the peace sign or in the visma world we make a v with our fingers here and we put them across the uh, OK and the menu key here and hold those two buttons down the 100. After a few seconds, the screen will flip to the service screen. And if you see active message there uh, at very top, you see it highlighted, that means that there's an active message currently on the boiler that needs to be addressed. I could hit the OK button here and I could enter and have a look at what that message is. Or I can scroll down and I could go down to the message history. And again, if I want to have a look at what the archive messages are, I can have a look at there. So there's, again, the current and, and archive messages on the 100. The 200 boiler, a little bit different because the screen's different. Navigation is a, a little bit different here as well. It's a full touch screen um, capability on the 200. And if I want to retrieve an active message, uh, I'm going to hit the menu key up on the top left-hand corner. And from there, uh, down here in the bottom uh, right corner, you'll see message list. So active messages are going to be stored right here uh, as far as, as uh, navigation. So simply hit the menu key down the bottom right, you're going to see a message list. If I want to have a look at the historical messages or archive messages, I'm going to push this little arrow key down here. And that's going to move the screen over for more information. And what wasn't there before is a little service icon, which I can push on that with my finger. And then I'm going to type in the password, which is protected on the boilers here. So you have to know what that password is to get into the service menu. And from there, we have our service menu here. And we can have a look at on the bottom left hand corner here message history so we've got active messages at the very beginning just push the menu key and you'll see your messages if i want to see the archive or history i need to get into service and i can have a look at that message history on the screen there so here i am in active messages on the 100 on the left hand side and you've got the 200 uh, uh, control interface on the right hand side 
And you'll notice that it, with every message that you get, and this is just an example because of our presentation being 154, uh, but your all messages are going to be date and timestamp. So we always put a date and a time in the boiler. It's one of the reasons why we do that to be helpful is not just for timers and things like that for the system, but also when you have uh, active messages like this, you kind of get an idea of when those, those issues are occurring. Uh, what dates and times? So you might find some commonality there. Or there's some traits going on with your with your with your system, uh, as long as the, the time and the dates are accurate uh, when you do your programming. The 100 boiler will give you the status message, but you don't get a definition of what that message is. You get the date and the time. You'd have to go to the manual, and there it is, S154. And there's the exam the reason why the uh, why the status message is occurring. Is because the flow switch is in the open position when the boiler wants to uh, fire up for a, a temperature set point. Uh, if you have the uh, Wiesman fault code checker, which is available as an app, if you go on our website, you can find that and download it. It would be right in your electronic device. You could you could key in, and always make sure that when you look put the the message in there that you use that little period there. So S.154. It's a fault code checker though. It would only be related to faults, I believe. So it would have to be if there was a fault there, it would be F dot whatever and you'd be able to identify that. So I always encourage the guys that are technicians, make it easy on yourself and download that fault code checker as you're doing your uh, your um, your active uh, service and maintenance, you come across faults, very easy for you to identify what those faults are with that fault code checker. Uh, if I have the status here now, I can see that uh, with the 200, it gives me a better explanation, a little bit more full, uh, you know, full information on the 200, whether no burner operation due to insufficient water flow. So the primary focus here of the F S154 is the fact the flow switch is in the open position when the boiler would expect it to be in the closed position because we've got a call for heat. That would mean the pump is started, the which would mean the flow switch should get that uh, force of the flow of the pump and pushing that flow switch closed. Uh, flow switch is essentially just a switch. It's just an open, normally open switch that's going to close when we get that to pump in the right flow rate. Important to note that there is a minimum flow rate on all flow switches. Uh, they don't know uh, what your flow is except for that one position when we get to exceed or at the, meet the actual minimum. So the smaller boilers, the 120 and the 85s, regardless of the model, 2.16 gallon a minute flow switch. So you need to get at least 2.16 before that flow switch will close for you. The bigger boilers, about 2.9 gallons a minute, and that flow switch will, will close. And of course, the boiler will, will respond with that closed flow switch with a, a trough for, um, for ignition. Uh, we're going to show you how to troubleshoot the flow switch. Very simple with a continuity meter, something that's going to measure uh, you know, open circuit, closed circuit. And in troubleshooting, sometimes you might need a, a jumper wire to, uh, to uh, test the, the, the uh, the flow switch, et cetera, we'll, we'll move through that. And important, if you're ever replacing the flow switch, uh, and there's why that flow switch is being replaced is a, is a good uh, thing to ponder why we're replacing flow switches. But the other thing is that when we, when we tap that back down again, those flow switches are flow sensitive. You want to make sure that paddle is perpendicular in that copper pipe so that it gets full on uh, flow as that uh, pump is on. So a lot of times, guys, replacing flow switches, uh, if that flow switch is in the right position, the paddle isn't in the right spot. It, it might not get enough flow to push that paddle in a reliably closed position. So when we replace them, make sure we uh, address that and ensure that's in the right position. The other components... We'll see a little bit uh, better picture of these in the different models of boilers, but you can see internally we've got the return on the right hand side on all of these boilers and it's a common return. The, the domestic hot water connections are, are, are teed into the heating supply you can see at the bottom there. Then there's the pump and it's ECM pump, which means it's variable speed. It is programmed at a fixed speed uh, out of the box and all the boilers have a, a particular uh, pump speed that they're they're been defaulted to. Um, but it is a uh, programmable speed on these particular uh, pump outputs. They're not a three-speed switch. It's programmed in, in, uh, in coding. Uh, once the pump is on, it pushes through the heat exchanger, and then coming out the other side, you've got your operating limit and your fixed eye limits there. There's two sensors there with the T. Uh, and then you've got a sandwich in between those sensors, and the diverting valve is that actual flow switch. And then on all the boilers, 
there will be a diverting valve, which diverts the flow of water in between the heating system and the domestic hot water system. So priority is always domestic, and the switch is going to block the heating side of the boiler whenever the domestic calls. Important to note that it, the, there is a diverting valve in these boilers, and if we are doing anything with the boiler uh, in the powered off position, that diverting valve is always going to be in one specific position. Uh, so good to note there. And on the left-hand side, I've kind of just put in boxes the different the different components there as well. If you want to see them on the boiler, so if I'm standing in front of a 85 or 120 uh, or a, a, a 150, 199, so the 85, 120 boilers, doesn't matter if it's a HE or a, a, a 1HE or 2HE, uh, on the left-hand side, that's the 85 and 120. And if it's a B1HE or B2HE, 150, 199, it looks like that on the right-hand side. And you can see that pump on the left hand or the right hand side there pumping into the heat exchanger coming out uh, you can see the sensors sitting up there on the pipes as well on the two boilers and after that we've got our flow switch so flow switch up on the top here on the on the 85 120 you can see it on the piping here uh, on the a 150 199 and then we have the diverting valve in a different position vertical kind of the motors in the vertical position uh, separate motors on a vertical position on the 151 and 99 horizontal position on the 85 and 120 so a little bit different but as far as everything as far as components go they're in completely the same uh, series circuit there the combi boilers the same sort of idea uh open those up you've got your pumps on the right left or right hand side I get my right to my left right uh, here shortly pumping into the return coming out of the boiler in the supply here there's your sensors and then you've got your flow switches in their position and the diverting valve again uh, there on the left hand side of the boiler on the supply out uh, the flow switch itself uh, these schematics i know i don't expect you to be able to read these but we do have these schematics that come with every boiler if you're troubleshooting you need to have these little schematics available to you you can get them in pdf format on our website etc uh, but the flow switch, doesn't matter what model boiler that you have, is always connected to the burner control unit here, which is uh, uh, itemized as a B on the uh, wiring schematics. I'll highlight this a little bit, a little magnified a bit more for you here, but every flow switch is connected to the X6 connection on the burner control unit there, just a two-pole switch here in the normal open position. Uh, so as far as troubleshooting there, we'll, we'll kind of walk through that a little bit later on, but there you kind of see where, it, where that flow switch is kind of wired to on the boiler when we're doing troubleshooting what we're going to we need, need to kind of look at on the uh, system or on the boiler the 154 status as far as scenarios go like what do we have uh to kind of look at at startup commissioning i've spent a few friday afternoons with with stressed out contractors with s154 uh, on the screen uh, after they finished the commissioning of the boiler and they're trying to figure out why that boiler is not firing up for them when it's when it should be so we're going to kind of look at that scenario fairly intently after servicing or replacing a component uh, that required you to drop the system pressure down or release some fluid out of there uh, anytime that we're kind of adding air into the the hydronic system there we need to have some function to make sure we get that air removed so the boiler is going to operate uh, effectively and realistically the same kind of procedure that we use in commissioning a startup would be the same kind of thing I'd recommend if you're having trouble with S154 after you've done a fairly extensive um, replacement of a component or whatever in the system that required the pressure to be dropped out. So we'll kind of follow on the same lines with those two uh, scenarios. Maybe you have the S154 only occurring in space heating in your system. Maybe the domestic spine, but when the boiler goes to fire up in space heating, the S154 occurs. Uh, possibly it's the reverse spacing is fine but in domestic hot water uh, uh, mode the boiler goes into s154 or you might have it in both scenarios where it doesn't matter what's happening heating or domestic the boiler is uh, blocked with an s154 uh, status message that could be a you know a boiler that's been installed for you know a couple of years a couple of months a couple of weeks a couple of days we'll kind of go through what that might look like and some things that we've seen um, on the tech side that have caused the S154 on both sides of the system here. So that's what the message looks like again. And just to look at some applications here. And the first thing to do when you're kind of looking at a system as far as 
as hydronics go, is important to get the air out of these these heating systems before we we fire that boiler up or turn it on. And often what guys will do is they'll install the boiler and then they'll do all their filling and their venting and stuff like that, get the pressure up, and then they'll turn the boiler on and they'll do their commissioning. Uh, with these uh, new 100s and 200s, I would uh, you know, recommend you don't stray too much from what you typically do, but you want to do the final phase of filling and venting or air purge with the boiler on and the commissioning. That's the important thing to kind of note here. With this particular system, you see that it's just space heating only. There's no domestic hot water. That means that the burning valve is going to be in one position. It's never going to move. It's always going to stay in the heating position here. These systems tend not to be too problematic on startup, but you will still, you know, the tips I kind of show you uh, moving forward here would still be applied if you're having some issues with, with that S154. But you can see you've got everything here. I can isolate every loop. Uh, every zone valve here in this system, and I can purge that system, those those zones out individually here without uh, with and making sure that no air gets back into those as I'm doing my system purge. I can work all the way back to the boiler here before I even turn it on and get that filled up and pressurized. I've got all the, the sediment faucets, boiler drains in the right areas, the isolation valves here that I can work with to get that system purged uh, before I get that, that boiler started up. Um, so typically not too much of an issue with this system uh, as far as a commissioning goes, but uh, again, the tips I show you here moving forward will be valuable if you are stuck in S154. The uh, other option here for doing an application with a combi boiler would look something like this, where you've got your domestic hot water in the combi system. That diverting valve is now going to be active during normal operation of the system, and certainly during the after commissioning, the, we're going to have that diverting valve moving. Same kind of idea here is you can you can do that that active uh, filling before the boiler is even powered on here, or you can get all the all your heating system kind of purged out, utilizing the the boiler drains and the areas that, I sh that I've kind of depicted here, and uh, and then move all the ways to the boiler side here. But this uh, system here could possibly be susceptible to S154 if we don't do the fill and the purge functions during the commissioning. Uh, and again, uh, I'll show you the way I'm successful with getting out of that commissioning and knowing that that boiler is going to fire up in domestic and or space heating with, with some with some fairly high uh, rate of reliability. In domestic hot water in space heating mode with the HE boilers, whether it's a 100 or a 200 kind of pipe like this. Again, the same idea. I'm just putting in the areas here where uh, you always help yourself as a as an installer if you put areas that you can get the air out of the system effectively here by by uh, you know actively adding a hose uh, to your uh, piping connections here and purging that getting that air vented out of the system before we start anything up. But you're going to want to use the fill and the purge function during your commissioning with these systems definitely to make sure that we get the air completely out of both sides of that system. What happens oftentimes is we're going to 100% purge out one side of this system. Uh, the other side uh, will not be purged out. We, we scroll through the commissioning without doing the proper fill and purge. And then when the boiler goes to fire, we let big slugs of air in because the diverting valve starts to get activated here. So uh, important that we use the fill and purge function during these particular applications. And another application that's possible, we'll talk about this one here a little bit later on as well. Uh, for different issues, but we also have, uh, say it's a retrofit application and you're just adding the boiler to an existing system. Maybe those tanks are already connected to the heating system on the secondary. Uh, you can uh, deactivate the diverting valve by in the programming and commissioning to tell it that, that the domestic hot water system is not connected directly to the boiler anymore. It's downstream. And of course there are relay outputs on both boilers for that domestic hot water pump. And uh, now uh, the diverting valve in this application will stay in this, the spacing uh, position even when we're in domestic hot water operation. Uh, a little bit easier to purge this particular system out because the diverting valve again is in that one position. Uh, but if you're having some issues, just follow along with what I'm about to show you. And uh, you, I guarantee you'll have a lot of rate, higher rate of success uh, using these uh, filling and venting functions. So the manuals that we are going to dig into here a little bit uh, on the 100 on the left hand side and right hand side is your 200 uh, interface. There are the manuals that uh, that we use and the information about how to use filling and purging during the commissioning will be uh, 
covered in these uh, manuals. So page 42 to 44 on the 100. On the 200 boiler, it's pages 16 to 18. If you want to have a look at those, there's the QR codes. You can feel free to, to grab your phone there and take a, a shot of that. And that will take you right to these manuals and PDFs uh, of these manuals that you can uh, have a look at and, and review. Uh, a second manual that's available, it's more of a, a startup sheet more than anything else, really. It's a couple of pages. And both 100s and 200s have a quick startup guide available. Uh, and in section 19 on both of them, uh, you will see that it covers filling and bleeding, purging of the heating system uh, as well in these areas. So it's a fairly important part of the whole commissioning process. It's, it's covered in, in fairly high detail in the manuals here. And you've got a PDF of that too if you want to take a, a screenshot of that. Uh, feel free to do so. So the 100s on the left-hand side, the 200s on the right. So the two manuals that I kind of referenced when I went through this presentation are those uh, two manuals there, and you'll you'll be able to kind of walk through it with me. Uh, how the fill function actually works. So if we were to uh, go onto the boilers, uh, use the, uh, the fill function, what's going to happen when I turn the fill function on in commissioning, and I highlight that, and I click the OK button, is you'll notice that what happened to the diverting valve is we have now all the sides are open. So in the filling function, the diverting valve goes to a third position, and it opens up all of the, the ports so that all sides of the, the system are now open. So now when we're filling up the boiler, both domestic side and spacing side are now going to get, uh, now going to have water uh, able to get in there and get that air out of those those piping connections as well the internal pump is going to turn on so with every fill function and commissioning this is what happens so as you're filling up the boiler diverting valve is now out of the way the pump is helping you kind of move the fluid around as we move through this system so that's what the fill function is going to do for you and this is what I will typically recommend if I got a, a guy stuck on the tech line and I want to essentially to help him out to walk him through this in a, in a fairly timely fashion. Uh, in commissioning, we'll start off with, again, you could use the HMI, which I'm going to do here. You could also use the app if you're doing so. But I have the system filled, as I mentioned. All Everything's filled up here and ready to go. Uh, but I want to have that final step of making sure that the boiler uh, system completely filled here. So now I'm going to isolate the boiler loop. So the primary loop on both these, you see the isolation valves are now closed. I take my uh, hose on the return side. I connect it to a water supply. Or if it's a, if it's a glycol system, your charge cart will connect to the boiler return side here. The uh, supply side going out, that drain, that boiler drain is connected to a hose down to a drain, floor drain. And notice that the domestic hot water isolation valves are opened here. So the only thing I'm isolating is the system. The system's already been purged, they uh, pressurized, it's already good to go. Now I'm focusing on ensuring that the boiler is properly uh, purged and filled out here. So I've got everything set up. I'm going to uh, turn on the water supply here now. Uh, and have that uh, have that drain uh, side open there, so I'm not putting the pressure up there. I'm going to pop a relief valve. I want to make sure that I'm, I'm draining that out as I'm active. And there's a minimum flow rate to recommend, 800 liters for the 185 or 120, which is around, I think, about three and a half gallons a minute or so. It's not really a high flow rate. 1,100 liters an hour for the 150, 199 is what we kind of have as a minimum flow rate, which is just under five gallons a minute, 4.9 or something like that gallons a minute of flow. So we need at least a minimum amount there to have velocity to get that fluid around and, and pull the air and train the air and get that out. Now that the valves are open, I'm going to leave them open with that diverting valve in the middle position and the filling active. Let it go until all those little slugs of air are, are, are finally removed. You have no more kind of hissing and sputtering of the air moving through. You got a good continuous flow of water or glycol in your charge cart moving through there. And then once I get to a specific point where I'm confident most of the air has been removed, I'm going to start to toggle those boiler drains down. Having a look at my pressure gauge, getting my pressure up to at least the minimum is recommended as 12 PSI, but typically about 3 PSI higher pressure here 
than what your uh, rated expansion tank setting is. So if you're at 15 PSI in your expansion tank, like 18 PSI would be a good pressure to kind of settle in on, on your, on your uh, cold fill pressure here. And uh, again, you're just kind of eyeballing that uh, pressure gauge and toggling those boiler drains down until you get your right pressure. And then you're going to shut that, that uh, filling function off because you've just achieved the filling area or filling function. And now we can move to the perch function. And what happens in the purge function is kind of a 30 second on, 30 second uh, off, and then 30 second on type of, a, of an interval with the purge. And when I turn this on, what's going to happen is the diverting valve moves to a position, and then the pump comes on for 30 seconds. And then it runs for 30 seconds. It stops. The diverting valve moves to another position. You'll see it on the screen there. It, it changed from the spacing side to the domestic side now. And then the pump is going to activate again. So what you end up with for 30 minutes is this on-off of the diverting valve moving from one position to the other with the pump also turning on in that specific position. And it's a really good opportunity uh, for, for me to confirm that I've got the air out of both sides of my system here. So I'm going to enter the purging mode after doing fill. I can unplug the flow switch at this point in time. It's not doing anything. It's just sitting there and I can use it for test purposes and I can unplug it. So you can see the little 33 connection there. I unplug it on the flow switch and I'm going to take my meter and it's in continuity. So it just beeped there. You'll notice the screen change from the open circuit to the closed circuit there. Uh, so I've got it in continuity. And now what I can do is I can test the flow switch with the boiler in both positions during the purge function. So what I want to do is I want to uh, wait until the pump starts and purge. And I know that diverting valve is in one position. doesn't matter which position it is. I know it's in one of the two positions. And then I want to put the meter across my leads, as you see on the right-hand side, uh, on the flow switch, and watch my meter. Does it beep when that pump starts? Does it go to a uh, closed circuit? You see on my meter here, it went from open to closed. That tells me that that flow switch just closed in the position that it's in right now. So I've confirmed that I got flow on that side of the boiler. Now I can wait for the pump to stop. And now I know when it stops, it's move, the diverting valve is moving to the other position. And now I wait for the pump to start again. And I go from the open position on my uh, meter to the closed position, or the, I get the audible beep from continuity. Then I know that side of the boiler has also been, uh, I've got flow on that side of the boiler, the flow switch is actually closed. So I've just proved now in purge that in both sides of the boiler that that flow switch is closed. I know with confidence now that that, that system's going to operate. What Mark didn't jump in, and, and he's probably uh, probably sitting there reading the comics right now, but what he didn't mention, I should have mentioned to you here, was that I opened up after the fill function, very important to note, that after I did the fill, I opened up the isolation valves here on the primary. So I've got full flow during that operation. If I don't do this critical thing of opening up those valves here after I do the fill uh, um, uh, function, then of course the diverting valve here in the, in the spacing position won't close the flow switch because it'll just be dead hitting the pump. So open up those, those after you get that fill function, you're gonna have all those boiler isolation valves now in the open position. My apologies for not mentioning that earlier. I, I wasn't gonna uh, criticize you, I figured you'd get to it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd jump in. Uh, the post commissioning. So if I was, uh, if I was just finished a, you know, some retrofit, uh, maybe added a, some baseboard to the system or I replaced a system pump or something happened that I had to drain the system down a bit. Now I want to get the pressure back up. I don't have to go back into commissioning if I want to uh, activate this. What I can do uh, with both boilers, I want to, if I want to use these functions, I can kind of make my own fill and vent functions in uh, with the boiler in, a, in, uh, in what we call actuator tests. So with the 100 boiler, your little peace sign or make the V with your finger, put them across the OK and the menu key on the top. With the 200, you just push the menu key. And I'm going to scroll down uh, uh, in service with the 100 uh, to actuator test. You'll see that in a second. With the 200, I'm going to go to service. And I'm going to type in the password there. 
So I've got actuator test on the top here with the 100. I'll eventually get there now with the 200 in service. So there's actuator test on both of them. I'm going to, it's going to say, do you really want to get into actuator test? It really wants to make sure you're certain you want to go into actuator test because it's going to turn all of the relays off. So if the blower is firing right now, it's going to stop firing to go into actuator test. So I push the OK button or the check mark, depending on which control I'm using. With the uh, 100, I go into heating. With the 200, I push the little arrow down the bottom here. It's a little easier for me to go into actuator test and testing the diverting valve and the pump if I use the arrow key here and push to a, a different area of the screen. And now you can see I've got my diverting valve in the 100 right here and diverting valve in the 200 right here. And I could put that diverting valve into any position, middle, heating, domestic hot water. You can see that change on the screen here as I go through. And as well, I can look at the pump here and I can turn the pump on to 100% or any speed in between there and I can have that pump activated. So I can effectively... If I wanted to fill the system, I could put the diverting valve in the middle position, do my fill as I did in commissioning. If I want to do the purge function, I can just uh, toggle the diverting valve from heating to domestic hot water and turn the pump on and effectively do the exact same thing out of commissioning here. Oops. There we go. The uh, other option or scenario I didn't mention in commissioning, but if you're piping your boilers without primary secondary for your heating system, this is a fairly common area where you might run into some trouble here. Uh, the reason being is that you're chopped up your heating system now into micro loads. So instead of a big lock load where the pump's on and it feeds all of that area, or in a primary secondary system with a boiler pump that's closed the flow switch is only dealing with the flow on that primary side. Now we're utilizing that internal pump here in the boiler to push through the boiler here as well as pushing through all of these zones or more importantly, maybe only one zone is open and now you've got that one flow right there, one zone open. And if that pressure drop is, is quite high in that system, we might not meet the 2.16 or 2.9 gallons a minute through that one zone and you might end up with that S154 as a result of that particular issue. So what's going on there is when that zone is in operation, we are dropping down below this minimum flow rate that closes the flow switch on the boiler. And of course, the boiler just pump sits there spinning and we have the S15 status and the boiler's not heating up. So this shows you the default pump speeds in the different boilers. This is the 100. Here's the 200 uh, and the uh, uh, the larger, sorry, this is the, one, the 100 and the 200 smaller boilers, 100, 200. And this is the larger boilers. And again, the minimum flow rate is about 2.9 gallons a minute. So sometimes with these applications where we don't have primary secondary and we've zoned the system like this, now we have to know with certainty that we have at least meeting the minimum flow rate with all, all these zones just on themselves. So you might want to check with this zone open, check your continuity, close this zone, open this zone, check continuity. Maybe one of those zones is not giving enough flow rate and you get the S154 fault. If you were to read the manual, in the 100 one in particular, it mentions that if you have something, components in C that may isolate the flow of the pump. So what they're talking about here is C is the heating system. So if you put zone valves in your heating system that will block flow in the system, then we recommend that you have ensure, not recommend, that you have some sort of active bypass in there to make sure your minimum flow rate, and there it is, it will be achieved. So properly done, these types of systems should ha have a bypass in there that when this zone that opens, it, has min it drops the flow rate down below the minimum of the flow switch, you've got enough residual flow going through that bypass there that, that we, get, we meet the minimum flow rate achieved in your system. In my opinion, you're so close to doing primary secondary here, the, the cost difference between the pump and, and closest and a couple of T's here to make this primary secondary versus that bypass is well worth it. The primary secondary system actually requires, it'll cycle less as far as operation when the bores are uh, in operation. Uh, longer run times, more efficient, uh, you know, less cycling usually means less problems with the boiler. So if I was looking between these two, uh, non-primary secondary with a diverting with a pressure activated bypass or closely spaced T's in a pump. Uh, Hundred percent of the time, I would recommend the closely spaced T's in the pump. Just less problems. Just 
uh, Boyer loves a, a, a good, reliable fixed flow rate uh, as far as its operation. So these, uh, these systems here may require that we put some sort of a bypass in to ensure that they operate. On the domestic hot water side of the system here, uh, if your heating system is fine, but you end up with S154 when the, whenever the boiler goes into domestic hot water mode, uh, what we need to look at now is the path of the domestic hot water uh, system relationship to the boiler. Uh, we can check to make sure the diverting valve is in the right position. We can do the tests and actuator tests as we just let a look at. Uh, but the piping diameter here is sometimes very critical. What Remember that pump inside of the boiler is now responsible for pushing the fluid through the boiler, through all this piping, through the heat exchanger of that tank and back around again. And we have to meet that minimum flow rate. The recommended minimum diameter is typically one inch from the boiler to the tank. However, depending, and I see sometimes we have guys that will pipe because the tappings on the indirect tanks, not always Beastman tanks guys use, uh, but sometimes those are only three quarter inch tappings on those, those indirect tanks. So they're just pipe in three quarter inch from the boiler to the tanks. And of course that's causing a fairly high pressure drop. Uh, and that could uh, result in that flow switch not closing here. So one inch minimum, and you might need to be even larger than that depending on what the pressure drop is in these coils. So if the if these coils here have a high pressure drop, and let's have an, an example here, not all tanks are created equal as far as those coils go. Uh, I've got a, a popular indirect tank in our neck of the woods here that I'm going to show you that guys use a lot, uh, along with the exact same volume capacity of our Wiesman uh, 300 uh, series tank, the EVIA. And you'll see here, there's the, the flow rate on the, the horizontal, on the vertical axis here, we've got our pressure drop in feet of head. So I try to convert this as much as possible, make it uh, realistic. So the maximum flow rate in a B1HE120 at 100% pump speed is about 6.2 gallons a minute. So if we're trying to main six, uh, maintain that 6.2 gallons a minute, we'd have to make sure that we keep the flow rate or pressure drop uh, in the domestic system down below 3.3 feet of head. So there it is, 6.2 gallons a minute. There's our pump curve at 100, and there's about 3.3 feet of residual pump that's available. With our EVIA tank at 6.2 gallons a minute, we got about a 0.4 feet of head of pressure drop there. So really low uh, pressure drop in the coil versus this tank over here, where at 6.2 gallons a minute, you got about a six uh, feet ahead pressure drop in that coil. And if you look at 3.3 feet here, with this particular tank installed, you're not going to meet that 6.2 gallons a minute. It's going to be somewhere around five and a half gallons a minute, probably when it evens out based on the pressure drop in that system. So we couldn't even get our maximum flow rate through that uh, indirect tank uh, using this particular manufacturer's tank because the pressure drop is so high in that, that, that coil. The other option, if you're not sure about the pressure drop in the tank, the boilers all come with the relay outputs, as I mentioned, for these, these pumps. So it doesn't really cost you uh, more than the pump as far as the extra cost here. But you can cap those domestic hot water connections, and you can connect that indirect tank on the secondary side here. And in program, as I mentioned, you commissioning, you'll tell the boiler this is the fact, and it doesn't exercise the diverting valve anymore. And now the boiler only has to worry about the, the flow through the, the primary loop here. That dedicated domestic hot water pump is responsible for overcoming the pressure drop in that uh, in that specific tank that we're dealing with here on this side. So a couple of options there. If that is a really high pressure drop, not a bad idea to put it on the secondary side. The nice thing about the, the 100 or 200 boilers is they give, give you some flexibility that you can do that as far as your piping connections go. If I have a system that is, this kind of round in the corner here, that you've got uh, where you've got both spacing and domestic hot water modes, you've got an issue with no flow. Uh, typically what tech support will, will, will instruct you to do uh, when you're on site and you call them would be to unplug the flow switch in the boiler and, and, and put a jumper in the wiring harness going back down to the control, effectively bypassing for testing methods only. We don't leave the, the, the jumper in there. It's, that's not allowed by, by code. It's a safety. But we can jumper that. And the, if the boiler has the call for heat, it's going and the flow switch was blocking it. The boiler will now fire as a result of that 
uh, flow switch being bypassed. So you're fooling the blower effectively saying, yeah, we got enough flow rate. And if the flow switch is defective, the blower is going to fire up and it's going to do its thing. So now you know, okay, the flow switch was blocking the boiler, but it's firing without any issues now. I know that the flow switch is probably the reason why that uh, system wasn't in operation. So you can replace the flow switch fairly easily. Or you might come up with a fault. You might hear some percolation or kettling in the boiler. And then all of a sudden you get this fault message. I use the 100 as a reference here. The burner's locked out. And you got the fault F62, which is the fixed high limit was tripped effectively. So you'd have to, if, what this is telling me is that the flow switch was actually doing its job. You didn't have enough flow through the boiler for that for that flow switch to close. And now that you bypassed it, effectively we tripped the operating limit or the fixed high limit because we actually had no flow in the boiler. So this would be a, a different troubleshooting altogether here now. We actually have an issue as far as operation. So we would check the pump. Is that pump uh, overamping? Those types of things. We got some problem on that side of it. Uh, I would also recommend that uh, we have a look at the flow switch itself. Um, remembering uh, having a look at the flow switch here, this little picture, uh, I put a little metal washer up against the paddle of the flow switch here. And you notice it's extended out here. It's actually a magnet, not a spring that opens that that pulls the paddle back to its default position after the flow uh, of the pump is stopped. So this is magnetic. And it might uh, give you some indication if you open up the flow switch here. And you notice this one here has got uh, not as bad. It came back uh, for inspection, but it had a lot of buildup of debris on the paddle here, which effectively stuck the flow switch in the open position. It wouldn't, the, the, the flow wouldn't push the, the paddle closed anymore because it was all junked up. So if you have a lot of contamination of, uh, you know, of, of uh, metallic material in your uh, water flowing around, uh, uh, it could get uh, bunched up in the flow switch here because there is a magnet there uh, and that could cause that, that, uh, that flow switch to, to be, uh, to be uh, an issue. The other thing you might get if the if the the flow switch is uh, is still in operation, but you get the S154, is maybe you've got something causing the, the flow a higher pressure drop. So I always check the uh, filters and strainers in the system. Why strainers here? Uh, just out of habit now, because I had one that uh, we had an issue with for a couple of days, and uh, the problem was that when they had filled the system uh, in that particular street, they were also flushing the fire hydrants. So a whole bunch of silt got kind of in, introduced into the, the system as they're filling. And of course, it plugged up the filters almost immediately. And uh, the pump uh, flow rate, the uh, pressure drop was so high, it just wouldn't push the flow switch closed. So they check your strainers here in your system, your Y strainers or filters. Or your filters are plugged up, good chance. A lot of your, your, your components are, are plugged up. But here's some examples of some leaky systems. So this one here is a calcium buildup from actually a flow switch over years. You can see the white here is a dry calcium as that flow switch was dripping. And of course, a lot of hard water uh, and continuously kind of being uh, brought into the system because we have a leak that's going to cause some problems over time there. And that uh, resulted in a, in a, uh, a fault on this boiler. Uh, same thing here. You notice that there's a, a volute off of uh, a, an internal boiler pump. And this one here, same, I had a leak in the system and you had new water, fresh water being continuously introduced into the heating system. And of course it caused, caused a lot of corrosion, a lot of oxygen getting back in the system here. And those little uh, ferrous metal components there that are breaking off of that volute, guess where they're gonna end up? Probably in the pump uh, rotor or stator, uh, in the uh, flow switch, any uh, metallic areas there. If you've got uh, you know magnets in your system, that's probably what's going to be picked up or the ferrous components of this volute as it breaks down over time. Uh, magnetite, you know, as that, uh, as these uh, materials sit around in your heating system over time, uh, potential for them to develop into a uh, material here that's actually going to be magnetic. And this one here is completely corroded, a uh, covered a rotor of a pump and, and the pump failed, but it overamped here. Uh, so these are things we want to look at as far as, uh, you know, uh, issues, a poly B system, right? There's the old boiler sitting inside that, that, that poly B pipe. We don't uh, clean that system properly when we're uh, retrofitting. We could have a problem here. 
uh, and of course the limed up old uh, cast iron section of a boiler, same kind of idea. Uh, there's going to be some legacy from that old system. If we don't properly clean our new system or new, uh, you know, flush it out properly, that stuff could be reintroduced and causing uh, issues in our, in our boiler itself. Uh, so if you want more information on the uh, water quality of boilers, we actually have a webinar coming up on October 24th that's going to cover uh, this side of it. So it's an important part with S154 and we have issues with flow through the boiler. Uh, you know, that water might look clear when we're when we're uh, opening it up and, you know, uh, watch the flow of water. But I mean, they make Brita filters for a reason, right? Because there's going to be contaminants in there that you don't see, but over time they can build up and cause you particular issues. So there's going to be a, a nice webinar here about boiler water quality coming up in the future there. So that's it. Uh, as far as the S154, I hope that the information that you saw here was uh, the it was going to be useful. As I mentioned, it was just, uh, you know, I've, I've done some tech support and covered this particular uh, uh, status uh, message in these boilers. And I hope you'll find that, uh, you know, walking through some of these things will, will be a little bit helpful as we move through in the future there. So I do have the QR code here. If you want to give some feedback on the presentation, please feel free to do so. Uh, I've always been told to maybe put this on before I do the presentation, so it'll give people a chance to, you know, respond after the fact. But uh, here I am. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll present this at the end. Uh, if you want to uh, give some feedback uh, as far as what you found useful or, or not useful, and we use this to kind of, you know, uh, adjust our presentations moving forward. So we appreciate the feedback if you're going to give it. Uh, how are things going there, Mark? Very good. I didn't have anything. I had one question until now, and now I have two, so I'm going to give them to you. How's that? Sounds like a plan. I'm not sure what what, the, what the first gentleman is referring to. He says, what about service on the boiler? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Maybe you could maybe clarify a little bit more uh, in that, that uh, question. Uh, possibly. I'll turn my camera on so you can see what I'm, I, my mug here. Uh, maybe it was service mode he's talking about. What about service uh, in the boiler? There is a, the service function on the boiler, and that's kind of where I show where the actuator test was and where active messages and stuff like that are located. I, I'm not sure if that's what he's, he's, he's asking about, but um, mm -hmm. that would be service. Is he talking about the water side of the boiler, possibly service in the water side of the boiler? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he could, maybe if he's still still there, maybe he could just clarify what specifically about service he was asking about, and uh, I'll, we'll come yeah. back to that. Um, yeah. And the other one is, how do we clear the faults from the display? How do you clear think, the faults from the display? I think, I think what he's referring to is is the, the faults when they happen. If it's if it's um like an S one five four fault or something else that automatically resets itself, it'll just go away. Uh, if yeah. it's a lockout fault, you'll have to unlock the boiler with the with the fault unlocking procedure. I think you went through that, right? Um, the the history is stored forever in a rotational basis. You can go in and clear history if you. Yes. Clear the history in the 100. It clears all the different groups, so the service, the information, the status, clears them all. If you in a 200, if you clear the history, you have to clear each group independently um, because it'll only clear the group you're, you're you're looking at at the point. Yeah. So there is some ability there, as like as, as Mark said, there's some faults you'll have to manually reset. Other ones, if they're not a hard lockout, they'll just kind of disappear. But they'll they'll end up in that that message history that you can delete uh, if you wish after the fact. Anybody else? Going once. Going twice. We'll go four Sold. times. We'll go four times. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just to give, just so we didn't leave anybody out. We'll just go four going times. Going three times. Going four times. <laughs> oh, oh, one more. Yeah. See, I told you we waited. Good man. Cleared all of them in a 100, but the S154 would not clear uh, and was operational. So you, you have yeah. the 154 fault won't clear if the status is current so if it, any fault that is continually to be active will not clear so if you still didn't have a flow the 154 fault wouldn't go away it would clear it and come right back yeah so what the important thing to note here too is that you want to check active messages 
you just don't want to go into the message screen. So that's why I mentioned with the with the one hundreds and the two hundreds. Uh, if I want to check to see if there's an issue, uh, I will go to uh, check to see if there's an active message and it will highlight active message there. Uh, if the boiler is just off sitting there, you might have an S154 just kind of, but it won't be active. It'll just be saying nothing's happening, flow switch is open, it's not an issue. But you always want to check to see if that message is active. That's telling you that the boiler is currently attempting to do something, but there's a status that's, that's essentially inhibiting it from from causing or from from trying to fire up so active message is what we're we're, we're keying in on there right and, and again though if you if if you clear a fault in it and it's still there it's because it's still a problem yes yeah we have just because you kind of acknowledge it doesn't mean it's gone away absolutely we'll count to four again how's that <laughs> well if we have no more questions scott and i have no more answers um, yeah, if you, you can take with the lunch now. Yeah, that's right. If, if, <laughs> I'll be there in a minute. <laughs> um, if, if we, if you have any questions that come up, feel free to to email us, and we will try to deal with those questions as we go along too. Uh, you can send your emails to academy at vsman uh, if you don't know Scott or I's uh, other email, and we'll mm -hmm. we'll we'll get those on the list of Q and A and respond to you with the answers to those as well. Um, yes. Thanks, Scott. It was really good. Um, lots of information there Thank as you. usual. Thanks so much for joining us today and uh, kind of look forward to uh, you guys meeting up with you again in the in the next one as, as we move through here. we got a number of uh, webinars from September through October here that you guys can participate in. So hopefully you, uh, you log into a few more before we're finished up. And uh, I think the next one next week is me. Gee, I better get at awesome. that. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. I didn't think it was that close. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, Vita Dance 200 B2HA advanced um, controls. So we're going to go over all the control functions and what you can do and all the features and benefits of the 200 control over a 100 control uh, is where we'll go next week.